Hello, hello. It's 106.7 K-Rock, K-R-O-Q. Are we rolling? We're pretending we're live today. <laughs> we're actually on tape from an undisclosed location. No, we're not. No, we're not. This is David Bowie in the studio with me. Hi, Jim. Uh, hello there. How you doing? Hey, it's good to have you here. Very good to be had. I feel like I've uh, engineered this 23-year career in radio just so I could figure out how to meet you. <laughs> it's uh no seriously it's yeah uh, I, I knew that it's quite an honor so um uh you're playing let's see with trent Reznor and nine inch nails yeah you and your band saturday night yeah that's sold sunday out. night sunday the... night maybe a couple of tickets left for that there's three that i've seen okay three or eight tickets i've left. seen them <laughs> and no pillar in front of them though there's no pillar in front of them <laughs> they're good for you um, you're playing with the lame bat here in our decorated control room. And then, um, there's the pagan ball on Halloween. Yes. Okay, you were sort of minimizing that, saying it's a, just sort of a throwaway and knockoff or something like that. But yeah. It's got to be special. Well, know? it's special because it's, it's sold out. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it really special. <laughs> I call that special. That's a big deal. I think for it's going to be pretty special because it's got um, uh, it's, we've got a lot of really strange uh, psychic and and emotionally stimulating acts happening all the way around the place. So I guess it's fairly fanciful. Musically, is it going to be any different from the foreign um, shows? I think we're probably... We, we learnt a lot of stuff when we rehearsed, and we keep changing the songs nightly just to keep kind of interest going for us as a band. So I guess what we would do is just, like, play everything we know. But, you know, because it's... There's no... I guess there's no real curfew till, like, 11 or something, so we just do a lot of stuff. This is uh, Jed the Fish on K-Rock, and we're talking to David Bowie, who actually is live in the this studio. This is great. Can I get this? You, uh... <laughs> Do you really this want it? This is fabulous. You promise not I, to walk around with it going in your it's pocket? It's fantastic. <laughs> it's, Go ahead and tell everyone what little, it is. It's a vibrating heart uh, made of rubber. You can hear it vibrating. This is... Uh, not a heart-shaped heart, uh, like a human heart. Yeah, like a human a human heart. We're not talking Valentine here. The studio is decorated. It's a very disturbing piece of rubber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll let you decorate your hotel room with that. I thought I'd put it on Trent's like. speakers when he comes on for the last night. <laughs> it's just, just the kind of thing he'd like. Are you uh, doing Cracked Actor, song we just played? No, we're not. Actually, I'm glad you played that. I forgot. It's quite a good song, isn't it? Well, I haven't played it in a long time. And no left... vibe, buddy. No vibe. <laughs> I, I think, no, that's, that's quite an interesting idea. I mean, it's quite simple. Maybe we could try and get that together. We should do it in Hollywood, really, shouldn't we? We should do it here, because it's about here. It really is. It's about this place. Yeah, what did you say it was about? It was about, what about success? Yeah. <laughs> I said, for me, it, it, it epitomized the catastrophe of success. Catastrophe of the success. catastrophe of success. Yeah. Well, yeah. anyway, last time I played it was in 1987. It was about 5.30 in the afternoon, yeah. and this parent called up. And, you know, whenever we get complaints about material that we play on the air, controversial or pseudo-obscene material, it's never when the child hears it by themselves, even if they <laughs> tell their parents. And it's never when the parent hears it by themselves. It's it's always if the parent is driving along with the child. In this case, the question must have come up, um, what does give me your head mean or something like that? So this parent was livid and, and called me up and said, you know, what are you doing playing this kind of stuff? I, you know, I'm very upset about it. He wanted to talk to my boss or whatever. And uh, so I, I promised him I'd never play it again. So this is special to me playing and then, this And right then now. Hugh Grant happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sort of that song, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, I prophesize. It just sort of means so much. Let's see. Uh, God, by the way, can I just uh, can, can I just say hello to to uh, Micah? Hello, Micah. Hi, Micah. Thank you. That's, okay, that's Micah, he's on the mic with um, you, Mikey. Oh. I'm sorry, Mike. I got your name wrong. It's Mikey. Let's rewind the tape. Oh, Mikey. Hello, Mikey. How are you? How are you doing? So they say you're not doing the hits this time. Nope. You're doing the misses? 
that's that's my business. <laughs> 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 um, well, I, we we've got one hit, but I I've never it's one that I've never done on a tour before um, because it was sort of a strange throwaway thing under pressure that I did with Queen, and uh, I I thought that this would be a good opportunity to play it. Let's play it right now. <laughs> I haven't got my instruments here. Oh, hold on, I'll just go and get... All right, no, they're all here. Okay, we'll play it for you. All and right. it sounds kind of like this. It might be a little bit difficult, you know. We might have to do some seance work, you know, to get all of the original vocalists on this. Um, you know what, Rick, if you don't have that ready, let's just go ahead and play Heroes right now. Always oh, getting it ready here. Yeah, we can just play Heroes. Because uh, I heard you talking, uh, and I'm going to ask you some more stuff, because we got uh, David Bowie here in the studio at 106.7 K-Rock, Q FM, Pasadena, Los Angeles. Uh, because you had some uh, conversations and interviews with David Bowie, and, uh, and he was just talking about uh, how brilliant Heroes was in the simplistic guitar work by Robert Fripp in Heroes. So let's Who flip said it. that? Your buddy Brian! Oh, what did you? What did you have, Brian, in here? Oh, he was in here about four years ago, but I was reading this in a God, magazine. You've got a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey! It's one hundred six. Whoa, that was a nasty little it's cough. It's a tour cough, isn't it? Yeah. That awful. Oh, I'm coming back up for air. Okay, yeah, you can stand up if you like. All right. We got David Bowie in the studio here at one hundred six point seven K Rock Hero Q. Cover of the Lodger album was yeah. that plate glass. Um, over your face. No, actually, you won't believe this. It was fishing gut, very thin, that was taped onto the features of my face and then pulled by a bevy of assistants in the photo studio that, so that my face went all over the place. Now you it probably was very painful, but you're right. It could have been done with glass. Damn. Would have been simpler. I'd never, I, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I, I just assumed that, but look how wrong I was. I tended to go the long way around for you most were things. You drung up. Yeah, strung yes, out, I think, yeah. is the term. <laughs> that might be strung up as well. You have absolutely the most interesting album covers I have ever seen. Uh, very elaborate uh, setup, special effects, makeup. What was the most difficult one? That one, that one was the most uncomfortable one. I, I guess that so. was really, really <laughs> painful. Um, I can't think of any of the others that were that were that uncomfortable. Aladdin Sane. Uh, duration just... of makeup. I think Aladdin Sane took an awful long time. Um, Gee, bless his heart, uh, uh, spent hours of preparation on that. The guy who drew in the lightning bolt and all that. Yeah, that's uh, that's wonderful. Um, but I mean, real, real long, uncomfortable experiences generally are more on films. I mean, that like something like the Hunger, the thing, the vampire thing that I did. That makeup took. Well, I had to go in at three in the morning. And we weren't on the set until about eight or nine. So a majority of that time is having all that stuff put on. That, and then I have to take it off at night, and that would take a further hour. And that was really grueling. And that was state-of-the-art yeah, special. Yeah, but that's special. real acting for you. <laughs> that's, uh, that was uh, state-of-the-art special effects, as I recall. With at the time, appliances yeah. Appliances and yeah, everything, yeah. yeah. A, a dear old guy called Dick Smith, who was... Oh, he, yeah? He was the man that created the... Uh, the hundred and twenty year old Dustin Hoffman in Little Big Man. He Same is, guy. is is the Lord King God yeah. of makeup. Yeah, I think he's uh, retired now, but uh, I think I, I was his last uh, head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He puts out books. He uh, yeah. puts out instructive videos and stuff. Okay, so uh, why did you invite Nine Inch Nails on this your is tour? So cool. I was looking at the heart again. The 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 uh, <laughs> un undulating heart. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Why does it go both ways? Look, that one goes. I right. know. I was just noticing that. It seems to like re the motor seems to reverse each time yeah. you turn it on. Left, and up. right. Yeah, that's cool. Um, well, you know, um, Nancy Berry at Virgin Records, um, who I'm with in America, um, asked me if I would be doing a tour to support the album, which I very much wanted to do. Um, but I did tell her that I wanted to do it in a more unorthodox fashion. Um, and I suggested that we try and contact Trent and Nails because I'd read several pieces that where he'd uh, said quite fondly about uh, albums that Brian Eno and I had made in the past were a major part of, of some of the influence for his own work. And so I, I just kind of took the bull by the horns and, and phoned him up and asked him that if indeed he felt that way, 
would he care to go out on tour with me? And uh, he jumped at it. And we made it. We had to make the parameters six weeks because he'd just come off like a 14-month tour. Oh, yeah. Um, so he was fairly kind of wiped out. But uh, this one last bash, and we end Sunday night, which is a great shame because uh, this has been a, a, a really good-natured tour in terms of the actual travelling and um, working with each other and the collaborations. It's been terrific. I mean, they're a really great bunch of guys now to work with. Probably everybody that has tickets to the show knows, but... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> I just keep looking at that. I put these here to distract you, by the way. You succeeded, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably everybody that has tickets to the show knows this already, but uh, it isn't like uh, Nine Inch Nails plays, there's a break, and then you go on. It's all one show. Yeah, it starts off with Nails. Um, they work through their set, then I, I join the band, and we work through some some of my songs and some of Trent's. Then the rest of my band come on stage. So at one point, in, indeed, both bands are on stage. So how many songs in the repertoire do you both do? I mean, six. Six. Yeah. And you maybe yeah. pick three or four of those. Each yeah, night? that's right. Right. And and uh, <clears throat> and then I kind of go into my set, and so the entire piece probably works out to close on two two and three quarter, two and three quarter hours. So it's it's a good lengthy show to get through. Uh, but I must say, there's an incredibly good opening support band called Prick. I think they're terrific. They're really very, very good. Um, so get there on time. So get there on, yeah, kind of get there on time. Yeah. They're well worth seeing. We're yeah. talking to David Bowie here on 106.7 K-Rock, Carol Q. Have you ever been fat? What do you call this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm well over 145 pounds. <laughs> I haven't had this much weight on me <laughs> since I had responsibilities in my life. <laughs> no, not, not really. Unduly fat, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I dream of being fat. <laughs> what are the last uh, three concerts? Inside this skeletal figure. <laughs> <laughs> this fatty Arbuckle is screaming to be re-released. On Virgin Records in December. <laughs> All right, he's lighting another cigarette here. Uh, what oh, are the God. last three concerts you attended with your son? Who would be, what, 20 or something? Uh, he's 24 now. Yeah. Um, uh, let me see. The last one uh, The last one that we actually went to together was actually some time ago. We went to see uh, Pill. We went to see Pill. They were playing where we live, which is uh, that. This is just before Joe went to off to uh, university in, uh, in America. We went to see Pill in either Zurich or Geneva or someplace like that in Switzerland. And... Uh, he went upstairs before we went and came down and he put that coloured stuff in his hair so it was like brilliant red and green. And I was just about to tell him, if you think I'm going out with you looking like that, and, and he just looked at me <laughs> and I suddenly thought, God, I've become my father. It was a very weird experience. It was very strange. <laughs> So I said, did. "I'm really pleased you look like that, Joe. I really, that's that's how we should go. <laughs> <laughs> you and me, buddy. I'm sorry. Let me just go upstairs and get a pair of stack heel boots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm it was sorry. A, mo a moment in a father and son's life because he knew you, you were forget. about to ask that. Yeah, you saw the look on your yeah, face. Yeah, I think he did it out of you know, just why not." <laughs> <laughs> this is 106.7 K-Rock, K-R-O-Q. And do we have Under Pressure now? Let's play that. Hello. It's 106.7 K-Rock, K-R-O-Q. And that was uh, Under Pressure. Doing that one this time? Here, yeah, I'm mic. doing that. You know me. I like... <laughs> I really... I, I try and... You know what? I think the best thing, I like to be under the tyranny of the mainstream. So I just do like really hummable songs on stage most of the time. So who plays the Freddie Mercury <laughs> part? That uh, Come along and see. <laughs> no, okay. Um, I have a fantastic bass player called Gail Ann Dorsey. She's a, a singer in her, in her own right. And uh, I never realized how great a singer she was until like halfway through the tour. Um, we were just falling around singing bits and pieces one day at Soundcheck 
And I realised that she'd be just... She could really sing the hell out of this song. So she does uh, all Freddie's parts. Freddie had an extremely high voice. <laughs> and, and Gail uh, has just got it down. It's fantastic. She's so wonderful. She's That's such wonderful. a great singer. She, talk- she was with a band, uh, you may have heard her, called Gang of Four. Oh, yeah! She was uh, in that for a while. And, they just uh, actually put out a, another album. She may well be. Oh, re- but, uh, the new Reformed. Yeah, going for, she's yeah. not in that. No, no, no. Yeah. Now for the last while, she's been doing. Uh, I think she was working with. I know she was making a record. Maybe I think just as a bass player, she was working for Tears for Fears. I think, but uh, now I'm lucky enough to be working with her. I think she's a diamond. She's really wonderful. She really is great. We're talking to David Bowie on one of six point seven K Rock K R O Q. What's the most pleasant thing you can remember about working with John Lennon? Ah. <sighs> I guess probably, in, on reflection, uh, somebody that wouldn't put up with any of my crap. <laughs> Did you put up with his crap? Um, probably, because uh-huh. I think I was in so in awe of him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's one of those things that it's... Um, as, maybe it, like as the relationship was really getting strong, it was that time when the, you know the tragedy yeah. set in. But it it was uh, I think I think uh, he was a very very funny man. He he focused into the point of a conversation almost immediately, and he he did kind of cut through all the bullshit, all the bullshit. He just had such funny lines. I mean, people would come up to him on the street and say, "Are you John Lennon?" And he'd say, "No, but I wish I had his money." <laughs> <laughs> and they would immediately presume that it oh well it couldn't possibly be John then because he obviously wouldn't say that you know and I mean he just had he just had these nice little things about him just so pleasantly amusing. Okay, what uh, recorded the outside album with uh, Brian Eno? I yeah. guess you spent the first day in the studio redecorating. That's true. <laughs> yes. Well, we. <laughs> We try anything to kind of uh, take people out of themselves and put them in another place, and and we thought, well, redecorating always gets people's uh, imaginative juices flowing. So we we had all the band redecorate the studio. <laughs> uh, they put up curtains and wallpaper and redid everything, and rearranged all the furniture and brought new furniture in. And it was very hard actually to stop them and get them to start doing their music stuff. But it 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 certainly uh, it just Nobody would be asked to do that in any other situation. So, <laughs> so you know, the stimulus was there for some very amusing kind of uh, entries into a, a new realm of the unknown. What happened to the other 20 hours worth of material you recorded? I, I, Brian is probably making movies out of it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Music for Air Force number 15. <laughs> Something. He's actually doing that. He actually did an album with Jaw Wobble. Did you? Hear, yeah, I know. Did you hear that? I've only heard one track. It sounds really extraordinary. It's kind of a, a kind of an acid jazz thing. Huh. I'm not quite sure what to say about it. It's really quite terrific. I just received it today. Yeah. And oh, uh, I've not seen the cover. What's it like? Here, I'll go get it in a second. Uh, let me ask you one more question. Yeah. Then we'll play Strangers when we meet. We're talking to David Bowie here on the world famous K Rock. Uh, Richard Blade, who is a uh, also a big fan of yours, and uh, he's from Torquay. England, if you know where that is. Um, Torquay is, I'll tell you about Torquay, it's a seaside resort that has a hotel in it that was the impetus for the uh, uh, John Cleese char- character, Faulty, in Faulty Towers. That's that's what Torquay's best known for, that somewhere in that town, the original Faulty lives in his hotel. Yeah, go on. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, he wanted to know it. And actually, I've got lots of information like that, <laughs> Jedham. <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, he, he actually may not know that you're supposed to tour with Morrissey over in England. He wanted to know how you got together on stage at the Forum a few years back. Uh, Morrissey invited me to, to come and do uh, something with him. What did we do? Oh, I have no idea what we sung. Do I think you? you did Space. Space, yeah. Cool, man. We did Space. The Space Oddity. <laughs> Because I remember we you were really? kind of drifting in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it, drifting it, it in. It almost looked like you didn't have feet. Off. You almost looked like you didn't have feet. You just kind of were moving across the street. You looked like you were being wheeled out of the back. I had a little trolley. <laughs> Not unlike the kinds of trolleys that um, German veterans in, in those old war movies <laughs> seem to always be paddling along. I had one of those, and I was just standing on it. And 
<laughs> one of Morris's road has wheeled me on. Just pulled me on by a long string, actually. <laughs> we'll be back with David Bowie on the world famous KRI. Nice out chorus, David. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the. He's. Oh, I'm not I even found a use for my heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. I could amuse a couple of people with that. Okay. He, he had the undulating heart uh, in pants. Is there a, is there a, a French spectacular way to effect? Say, is there a French way to say in your pants? I'm sure there is. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Dolls la trousseau. <laughs> We're talking to David Bowie on the world famous K Rock K R O Q. Oh Got uh, three sold out shows uh, in town starting uh, Saturday night at the Forum. Okay. Um, oh, oh, in this uh, email conversation that was uh, boring both you and uh, Brian Eno one day, I guess, <laughs> oh, yeah. when you did that when you were in New York. Yeah. Uh, he said that uh, you said. Something reminded you of Goosebumps in 1976. Was that when you were collaborating on the Low album? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Uh, that's right. The same year, I think, I did uh, Idiot with Iggy. I think that's around that same time. That makes sense, doesn't it? We did the Idiot first. Some of the best... Like, like you would know. Uh, yeah. We did the Idiot first, and then we did Low. Yeah, yeah. And goosebumps. Yeah. In other words, you knew in the studio that what you had yeah, something special. Absolutely, I think for both those albums, it really felt like a new era. I mean, we, it was just so exciting because I mean, I think Iggy, it, it, it was great for Ig because uh, I think he felt that maybe he was going to be in there or somehow would be get tied up in the whole punk thing, which he'd more or less done anyway, like almost ten years before. Right, and. We were kind of being careful just not to be trapped into that, you know, so that he didn't become part of that genre. Um, because he's lyrically, I think, far more interesting than most of what came out of that period. Because most of that was attitudinal. It was just attitude rather than sort of quite perceptive kind of uh, literary thing. Um, and so we went somewhere else. And we, uh, we just, we, I don't know what that album was, but it was an extraordinary album. It really was. And and some of the things that I was trying out in tracks like Mass Production, for instance, were the kind of stuff that, that I then followed through when I started working with Brian. So there were elements in there that were sort of, um, uh, that were uh, almost a mattress for what I then went ahead with for Low. So that whole year for me was an extraordinarily productive time. Actually, you do Subterraneans. On, yes, uh, yes. Actually, that was uh, one of uh, Trent's choices. Yeah. Uh, was to do that. He plays very good saxophone. You know, he's a good saxophonist, and uh, he plays on. I, though he won't light himself when he's playing, so I don't think anybody realizes that it's actually him playing. He's, he's big on that. He hides. Yeah, in the yeah. Shadows. I know. I know. Yeah, he hides under his own rock. Right. <laughs> Um, tell us about uh, some art things. Um, okay. What you've done lately? Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, hey. That Jasper Johns, he's cool, huh? <laughs> How about that de Kooning guy? Yeah, yeah, that's great. And you know that one, you know that Marilyn Monroe by Andy Warhol? Oh, that, I've seen that. That's great, that's isn't it? has got lots of pretty colors in it. Yeah, that's cool. The one with the bullet through it. <laughs> that one sold three and a half million, do you know that? The one with the bullet through it when that woman came up and shot him. Because the bullet actually ricocheted and went into a Marilyn picture. No, and that's the one that went up for sale like last year and went for like three and a half million. Okay, let's not talk wow. about art. I mean, that's like cool. That's like art, isn't it? <laughs> my best friend, my best friend in the art community in Britain is a guy called Damien Hurst. He cuts cows up and puts them in formaldehyde. See, I wanted to get you talking about. We got the studio decorated <laughs> for Halloween. I wanted you to get you on the sick stuff. I'm glad you brought that up. I know nothing sick. I know nothing sick. That's, well, that's that's that's. You see, have you seen the Hearts Filthy Lesson video? <laughs> that's that's just a that's just a working artist workshop. <laughs> that's 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 what it looks. Have you? When was the last time? And answer me in all seriousness. When was the last time you went into a sculptor's workshop? Bet it wasn't this last weekend. No, it wasn't. Well, but, it looks like that. But it I really did, does. I have people in special effects, so I, I it kind of it kind of looks like that because there's so many people making stuff to do with the body and the inside of the body. There's a woman. 
um, whose work I saw in London uh, a year or so ago, I think, where she had one of those miniature cameras that, uh, on like a, it was like a laser camera thing, tiny little thing, and she just inserted it into every orifice in her body. So you like, it was just, and the, and the video screen was set in the floor, so you kind of just stood above it and looked down. You saw, you saw inside her, like intimately, every every which way. It was an extraordinary, a rather beautiful thing, Jed. Okay, what's her name? I don't know, but it it, it was... Uh, I don't think I wanted to find out. <laughs> She's in the phone book? Um, all right, but the whole castration artist self-mutilation thing, I mean, is this like a movement? I, well, you, you know, I mean... ABBA started? I, I was... <laughs> ABBA? Yeah. Yes. It, it actually is kind of retro. ABBA one, one, right? of the, one of the guys that I used to really admire a lot, and I wrote a song about him called Joe the Lion, oh, was yeah. Chris Burden. Uh, he was a performance artist in the early 70s. And I heard he, he was, was from the, Irvine, California. Yeah, I believe he was. He now yeah. teaches, I believe he now teaches, I think, conceptualism. I mean, he's, he's survived, he survived his very strange doings and went on to teach um, uh, in San Francisco at the uh, one of the fine art schools there. But he, um, uh, he did the most extraordinary things where, for instance, he, he, he uh, had himself... Uh, Shot, uh, uh, shot. Yeah, that was one. Dragged yeah, from a Volkswagen. Yeah, that was great. Then, yeah, Wasn't that's it cool? he crucified he on the back on of the Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Yeah, like dra yeah. dragged him down the yeah. street. And then, like, he, he like put himself in a bag, <laughs> and I was like thrown on on like a freeway in an elevator. All the tacks in the elevator. Yeah, that Did was you cool. See that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> well, he was that. He, he sort of did that kind of stuff. But I mean, one of the the central ideas to that was to <laughs> was to actually. <laughs> is to actually create uh, uh, um, an experience that was thoroughly taboo for himself, w which was to heighten his own perception of the uh, f uh, the finiteness of our life, um, but also to allow other people to uh, actually explore that vicariously through his actions. And it was very dangerous stuff, and it, and it's it's something that's really taking kind of a a prominence towards the end, end, end of this century. And that was like one of the many kind of movement things that, that Brian and I kind of thought we'd work into what we were doing. Because it was really, what we're trying to do is a diary of what it feels like to be around in 1995. So a lot of it was just symbolic representation of, of, of the attitudes and feelings of now. Really. Hey folks, he's talking about the Outside album. Yeah, right I'm now. sorry, the Outside it's album. David Bowie in the studio here at yeah. 106.7K, Ron Carroll Q. So how did the uh, Simpson-Goldman murder stack up as an art ritual murder? Pretty damn sloppy, I think. Um... Uh, it's probably just procedure as entertainment. I mean, you know, murder itself is 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 pretty much entertainment now. But it's, so it doesn't take one very big quantum leap to um, uh, perceive it as being a, an art form. Next, in fact, it was actually written about in that way. <laughs> um, it was first thought of in this particular way mm -hmm. by a guy called uh, Thomas De Quincey, who wrote an article in about 1820 called "Murder Considered as a Fine Art." And that's probably the first kind of mention of that particular notion inspired you would you find out about this on the internet or something or? uh no i've been i've sort of been interested in that and paganism and the idea of mythologies preceding judeo-christian ethics and all that you know mithras's birthday was de december the 25th oh <laughs> that sort of thing you know transubstantiation really being the mithras ceremony where they used to eat the eat the flesh and drink the blood of the bull that was the romans and kind of appropriated to become a Christian ceremony. So I think a lot of our thought actually retains memories of those pagan rites. And as people lose faith in, in, in organized religion, they can tend to gravitate towards some barely remembered, rather mutant ideas of what paganism is about. And it probably has something to do with the revival of tattoos and piercings and, and, uh, and those kinds of performance art things. It's trying to establish a new spiritual order without quite knowing which way to go. Great, you'd be celebrating that on uh, Halloween, as a matter of fact. Well, that, there's a, a case in point, yeah. It's a bastardization, but it basically has the same roots as all our pagan ideas. At the Palladium, for heaven's sakes.
Well, that's the 20th century touch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, two shows. I think you can get tickets. There's three left. I think uh, David saw three. Oops. Oh, as a matter of fact, if you'd like to go, why don't you give us a call? Uh, be uh, callers uh, 20 through 24 right now, and we'll set you up with some Bowie tickets. So thank you very much for coming to visit us it's here. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. World yeah. famous K-Rock. Bowie on the rock, everybody. I'll take my heart with me. Acoustic guitars from Epiphone Gibson.